Support for the Civic Sci TV network comes from viewers, readers, and listeners like you, and organizations such as the Berlin Science Week and the New York City Economic Development Corporation. Visit civicsci.tv.org to learn more about our network of programs. Mapping the global landscape of civic science by dissecting new insights from researchers, practitioners, and leaders in academia, government, for profit, and non profit organizations. This is Questions of the Day with Fanuel Muindi. So, what does science sound like? Well, this is a question I'd been pondering about for quite some time. Then I came across an article titled, titled The Sounds of Science, written by Sumit Kulkarni, who joins me today. Sumit, welcome. Hi, thanks for inviting me. So at the top of your article in the LA Times, um, it reads, and I quote, why just look at your data when you could listen? Scientists are turning their data into sound to gain new insights into things as small as DNA and as large as galaxies, end quote. Sumit, tell me, how did you come to even be writing this article? Tell, take us back a little bit. Sure. Uh, out of the whole spectrum you just described, I think I was motivated by it by on its larger end, uh, which is the galaxies. Um, that's how I first came across uh, this term called data sonification, which is the practice of converting scientific data or an image into sound. And I was quite enthralled. Um, and the specific application I first came across was uh, a sonification by NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory. Um, and what they really wanted to do was convert one of the X-ray images of, uh, I think it was like a supernova remnant uh, from, from an object known as the Crab Nebula in, into sound. And I was, I first of all, I just thought that's a really, uh, I was like, wow, <laughs> can can you convert an image into sound? <laughs> um, and when I read more about it, like I, it, it made total sense because astronomy, which is what I've been studying for the past few years as well, it's such a visual field um, uh, because like we, we always see pictures like recently from the James Webb Space Telescope, it is completely visual and uh, they really came forward and thought like, we need to make this accessible to the visually impaired, like uh, because like everyone needs to appreciate the universe. Like it's not just because we're collecting pictures doesn't mean that we should uh, keep it hidden from from those who can't actually see their pictures. So th this was an effort by them to like represent various parts of the image um, and kind of capture the excitement of of the, the, the far away um, based on that. So I, I th thought that was really cool. And when I was at the LA Times uh, writing as a, uh, working with the science desk as a mass media fellow uh, in the summer of 2022, I decided to write about it. That's, and, and for those who are listening, please do click down below and read the article. Um, so tell us a little bit, what did you discover in your research to write this article? Because, you know, you, you talk to quite of, at least in your article, you, you, you cover a lot of some of these scientists that are using data certification, right? Not only as a means to showcase the, 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 the science, but actually to discover, right? For discovery, as a process for discovery. Tell us what you learned uh, as you wrote this article. Yeah, that was one of the things I was most excited to learn about for sure. Like, so when you, when you start out in science writing, they always say, write about, uh, write a story and not just about a topic. And I knew I wanted to write about the topic of sonification, but it was through a conversation with my editor when we kind of chalked out, you know, how to write it as a story. And that's when I started like talking to people about because I knew from NASA's application that accessibility is one way sonification is used and it's uh, used in a really uh, impactful manner. But 
there have to be other motivations why people do it. Um, and I think it was my editor who also thought about asking around just, is, is someone using this for analyzing data? Um, and I just thought that was, that was a cool thing. So this is when I found out um, this group at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, uh, who work on studying how proteins fold and unfold. And that's something that can, that's really important in studying neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's because they are caused due to the misfolding of proteins. Um, mm -hmm. And they, um, they really, I think that was the first application I, I found when, where people were actually directly converting their sound into data and learning more about the data in that process. Uh, because these these processes that they were studying, they are so incredibly, they, they're either incredibly fast and complex, like even if you do the simulations of the proteins and watch it in slow motion, there are details that you can miss, uh, which you would not if you just converted that into sound, because our ears have a different, almost like a different way of uh, pattern identification than what our eyes can do or what even software that we write can do. Um, and in fact, a lot of the software that we use for data analysis are inspired by how we listen to sounds. Um, and the other example, which I could not write about since I was working in the field and there was a conflict of interest is, is the field of gravitational wave astronomy, where we study uh, these ripples in space time given off by events like colliding black holes and neutron stars. And the data that we get through gravitational waves is, it lies in the exact sound spectrum that, uh, that corresponds to our audible range. So we can actually play out, play out these collisions of black holes and they kind of sound like zzz. <laughs> um, and the, the way we analyze these signals from a lot of noise, the way we pick out these from a lot of noises, like we use algorithms that have also been used uh, for, say, analyzing music uh, or analyzing like time series spectrum, spectra corresponding to audio. Um, so that was like the second thing like I found about. So there's accessibility, there's like how you can actually do data analysis using sound. And then the third thing was I found people who were just doing it because uh, they wanted to produce music. Uh, so these were like artistically inclined scientists. So some of them were like, uh, drummers for you know a band that played in the 80s <laughs> uh, and and they yeah they they just wanted they they saw beauty in their data um and and, and then wanted... i think you are referring to a graduate student noah Germolis. that's uh, right because you have the jazz of ocean chemicals uh, right and so so i like you you kind of have separated these two camps right you have those who are using sound as a vehicle to actually you know, make discoveries, right, and, and understand the data, right, in new ways. And the others who are just curious about the music that it creates as well, right? Um, is there where, I know this is still a, an early field, people were been doing this for quite some time. Um, is there one camp that is doing more than the other? Like, is there a sort of more of the music side or more of the data side? <laughs> I would say, there are more people possibly doing on the music side um, I see. because uh, because few people consider sonification as an option to or, or explore it as an option to do data yeah. analysis. Uh, I, I think it's not uh, widely known uh, and that is something um, maybe you know if they, if more people learn about the story they might uh, think about ways to incorporate it into their own research. Whereas on the music side, I think it's just people who sort of see it as a hobby, uh, see it as an extension of their work, what they do in the lab, um, mm -hmm. and maybe try to find new inspiration uh, through the music. 
Could it be used, do you think, uh, on the music side as a vehicle for public engagement? Absolutely. I think it's one of the best ways uh, you can, uh, you know, just, you know, play a sound that's uh, kind of out of the, you know, out of the pop music or out of the ordinary and then get people hooked onto asking questions like, okay, what, what is this exactly? Uh, and you can tell them, oh, this is actually my DNA or, you know, one, one gene that's uh, that's been, you know, encoded from my own body. Uh, and and how, how cool is that, right? So it's, it's something I think that can be used very effectively in public engagement. The other thing also is like, uh, if you think about community science initiatives, um, mm -hmm. there are a lot of these which demand the user to, you know, maybe have an app or uh, do some visual data analysis, and and that that's that's great. But if you think about like why people want to take part in these initiatives, it could be that they are just motivated by that particular area of science. Like I would. I would personally spend a lot of time, you know, uh, identifying or classifying galaxies, for example. Mm, but as also as someone who also spends a lot of time at their computer, uh, you, you want other avenues to be spending that time. So if, if, if I get a chance to do that kind of exercise through audio instead, I think that would be that would be an another another way to contribute to science, uh, and, and at the same time not doing something like not staring at the screen for uh, for a long time. So I think that's there are ways in which you can creatively like catch catch on to people's attention. Yeah, and since it's publication, so you you published this back in February twenty twenty three. Can you share what was the response? Like, what, what kinds of responses did you get from people, uh, if any? Yeah, I've had to uh, term it. I think people were just like, "Oh, this is this is cool. This is uh, something that I didn't uh, seen before." Um, a lot of, I think. Um, let me try to. Yeah, it was largely like positive and largely about like how cool it is if I had to, uh, you know, encapsulate uh, this in a few words. Mm. Yeah, because because it's not uh, it's not new, it's just not mm. well known, right? And it's not done in, in volumes that where, for example, we're not having concerts, right, of sounds of mu uh, sounds of science. No, I would like to which, see that. By the way, which will, which will be cool, by the way, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but but yeah, because that, 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 that's the feeling that um, I'm curious about in terms of is there a potential here, right, to really use this as a vehicle uh, to in, to bring in the public, right? Actually, maybe do even that some citizen science using mm -hmm. sound. All these sounds that maybe have been created. It's use people's ears to like detect things, right? <laughs> we already do this for light. Why not sound? <laughs> Absolutely, and the other thing that really touched me was uh, the the story of Amy Bauer, who is who is a visually impaired scientist, and something as a student in science myself, we take for granted absolutely all the time is like mm. we always report results in terms of plots, visualizations, and that is like that that just leaves out a, a sizable chunk of people, I think even like leaves out the entry for uh, people, visually impaired people into the sciences. And uh, that's something we definitely need to do better. I think I've heard some people uh, think of ways to develop a uh, software that can uh, produce the equivalent of a plot, but in, in terms of sound. And if you, can, if you can streamline that, like there are so many tools that are widely used for data visualization, but if there are tools that are that get developed for data sonification, I think that'll be a great thing. Yeah, and I think maybe even the word sonification probably scares a whole ton of people away. Uh, <laughs> and, and there's a quote actually from what you were just talking about by Martin Grubele, the, the biochemist uh, whom you talked to. And, and I quote, uh, he writes, you have to think of that sound in the same way that you think about a graph 
as opposed to a painting. End quote. Yeah, I love that right. quote. Yeah, and that's, so I think there's there's a lot that can be done here, and I think there's uh, opportunities to engage the public. Of course, opportunities for more data analysis, more unique ways, for example. And and I will say that this is what inspired us to even create the show, Sounds of Science, as well. So in terms of reactions to your article, well, there's one. We, <laughs> a, whole, a whole new show was created with the same name. <laughs> I love to hear that. <laughs> that's, that's, that's an honor. <laughs> Thank you. So Sumit, you are a graduate student. You are, we're talking to you 10 days away from your defense, actually. <laughs> What did you What did you learn from this? Because you did this program as an intern at the LA Times during your graduate training. What did you learn from that experience that you're now going to take away as you move on to other things after you graduate? Well, I learned that I like, I personally like to uh, report on science that's happening across a broad, broad range as opposed to what I've been researching, which was like a very narrow corner of astrophysics. Um, and I like stories that make an impact. Um, so mm -hmm. I hope to keep reporting on these kinds of stories and uh, and based on people's response, uh, you know, keep finding like, you know, unearthed gems, uh, like, like, like this particular story, um, keep you know bringing out into the open things that that are not commonly talked about and that's that's what i want to do one step at a time yes uh, sumit Talkani, thank you so much for joining me today we hope to have you back <laughs> <laughs>